Uh, and, uh, you know, this is JVC Men's Breakfast. There's probably some new guys that haven't been here much, so our motto is no women, no vegetables, and all the bacon you can eat. And the guys told me there's still more food, so if you need another shot, go ahead and fill back up as we're talking. As you talk about food, especially eating meat, uh, a couple weeks ago we had the uh, sportsman show that our church put on, and uh, so a couple of us had this pretty well planned. We got in on the meat eating contest, uh, where you, you kind of eat all the meat you want and then you judge the stuff. Is Brandon here? Well, Brandon didn't really count anyway, because he was a little young and green behind the ears. He didn't know what he was doing, but I, I did see Adam. Where's Adam? Go ahead and stand up, Adam. See, you got to look at some of these guys because what you know, as a football coach, I love to look at guys and say, "Ooh, okay, that's that's an offensive tackle, or this is a tight end." You know, that's a running back. You just kind of look at how guys are put together. You can figure it out. So Adam looks the part pretty well, like he could eat pretty well, and he did a good job. But he's he's kind of white trash, redneck a little bit, and so Adam sitting in there. And they have a bunch of these people that have official gear. I never knew it existed. Kansas City Barbecue Society. And Adam is sitting right between two of these ladies. And they're pulling the meat, smelling. You should have seen Adam. He just takes bites. And then he starts looking at these gals. And so Adam tries, it's like when you wipe wrong and you sniff your hand a little bit. That's Adam. Starts, he doesn't even know what he's sniffing, and he's trying to sniff this meat. It's like, so he was kind of trash, but now Bill, stand out. Look at Bill. That's your guy for the eating contest. I mean, there, there's no question. And so Bill comes in, and the first thing Bill did is sat right down, and the entire rib just went like a grinder. It just went right down. And, the, and that Kansas City lady's like, uh, sir, one bite in the middle, please. We're judging the quality of the meat. Well, give me another one then. And so Bill was great, but the last guy, and a lot of people just call him day late, dollar short Dave, but where is Dr. Irvin? Where is Dr. Irvin? Go ahead, you've got to stand up. Where's Dr. Irvin? So stand up, Dr. Irvin, and then Dave, you've got to stand up. Stand up, or, I mean Bill, Bill, stand up. Now, you're looking at these two guys. Who's your selection for all state? And so... Dave sees this going on, and he wants to get in on the eating contest, and the dude with the pig on the spit, you know, remember him? He grabbed Dr. Irvin by the ruff of the neck and said, no, 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 no. And he just sent him right down where they were selling the purses and stuff like that. They just got rid of Dave. So it's just kind of fun to watch what happens at uh, the sportsman show. You always learn a lot. Uh, But today what I wanted to talk to you about is fundamental transformation. Uh, and I heard this phrase a while back, and you start thinking, what does that mean? And so you have a couple of handouts. Uh, one will go through these. You'll see them go. There's four sections. Uh, what are your fundamentals? What are the foundation for those fundamentals? Then we're going to do a word search, because we love doing Scrabble and word search stuff. And then what is progress? So that's kind of our outline. We'll start up here with fundamentals. And so what I want you to do with your groups is tell me, uh, what sport are you watching here? All right, what sport is that? Okay, so we're going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, this is football. That was not football. I want you to watch that pulling lineman here. Here's the rookie around the left side, and in he goes for the touchdown. All the receivers on that side of the field, and watch, I think it was Alex Mack who came all the way down the line to get a piece of Adrian Amos, and that was the difference. Amazing, he was able to get... So football has fundamentals. If you're on offense, what is the fundamental for football? Well, you want to score, but what's your fundamental that you must employ in order to score? Blocking! You block. So what is the fundamental of football? Blocking, if you're on offense. Okay? Now we're going to look to defense. I remember this Super Bowl when I was a kid. This was great. And it turned on a dime on one play. Icky Woods at that time was having an incredible year. It was phenomenal. We had to slow this guy down. Icky Woods hadn't had a guy hit him. And he got up saying, man, 
That guy hit me. How many gunslingers you know that they got that defining moment and they got to go up against Jesse James? And it was a sound that is just indescribable. Woods again, his fifth carry. Woods, he had. It changed the game. It took them from being a running team to where Boomer has to throw the ball. He put fear in people's heart. And when you want to hit a guy like Icky Woods, the ultimate thing to do is to lay him right on his back and to get respect. I said it last night, baby, we just look at each other after this game and look at our hearts. Everybody sold out this week. Everybody. Damn, it's great, isn't it? Yeah. You got it. So I remember watching that where the Bengals, and they're saying it was run five, uh, the Bengals are running the football, owning the game, and then bang! That hit changed the mentality of everything. So on defense, what's your fundamental? Tackling. So you have a fundamental on offense, which is blocking, and a fundamental on defense, which is tackling. And then Ronnie Lott, one of the, he's a great player, will go to number one in your notes. Everything rises and falls on leadership. That Super Bowl rose for the 49ers on his leadership on that one play. It fell for the Bengals because Icky Woods now bowed down and he did not play the rest of the game. It changed everything for the Super Bowl. Uh, so as we look at fundamental, if you're going to have a fundamental transformation, that means you're transforming your what? Your fundamentals, right? You're transforming whatever your fundamentals are. How would you know Let's say you're in a country undergoing a fundamental transformation. How would you know you're doing that if you don't know your fundamentals? So you guys all failed the test. And 100% of the people that I've, I've tested this with all fit in the same category. Is this football? What do you see circled? Blocking. Does that look like football? Yes, that's football. How do you know? What's the fundamental happening? They're blocking. You've got two double-team blocks. And then on the other side of the ball, what do you do? You tackle. That's a Ray Lewis tackle right there. Sometimes it's hard to tackle a guy. Uh, well, see, here's a good one. To exploit that. What is that? The quarterback boys from Ryan Tannehill. He almost got the jump. Yes, he did. He gives it to Henry. Henry trying to get to the outside. The defender, Josh Norman, to his backside. <laughs> But it was still fun to watch. <laughs> when you come in against Derrick Henry, you better go low. Do not stand up with that man and let him just throw you out of the club. Watch the reaction from the sideline. Well, listen to the crowd. It's not a big crowd, but they're fired up. So you watch that, you kind of see there's a man and there's a boy. If you can't employ your fundamentals well, if you're not tackling well, how are you going to do? If you can't block and you can't tackle, you're not going to play football. So this may seem a little bit subtle, but it's of vital importance for a bigger picture. What are your fundamentals? Do you understand what they are? Because if you don't understand what they are, you would never notice if they've been removed. All of you called this what? Football. That ain't football. That's seven on seven. What two fundamentals have been removed to go play seven on seven? Blocking and tackling, the two fundamentals of football. You cannot call that football if you understand football. You can be a great seven on seven team and a terrible football team. You can be a great football team and a terrible seven on seven team. It doesn't necessarily correlate. But you, if it's a, it might seem subtle, but if you remove the fundamentals, did you even notice? So look at this. We got a group of men who didn't notice the fundamentals were removed when I showed you a clip of seven on seven. Number two, if you don't know your fundamentals, you won't notice when they're removed. So let's take our country, the United States of America. Uh, and here's a question. What is our central fundamental, if you put one word to it? I'm going to give a couple to kind of kickstart it a little bit. We'll see what you guys think. It could be our thing. I mean, what holiday do you have where it's culturally accepted and you know you're going in to do nothing but eat? So it's big eating on uh, you know, Thanksgiving. We're well vaccinated. It could be that's our fundamental. 
I mean, you guys, someone has to laugh. This is pathetic. You guys are like all asleep. Man, I don't know what's going on. Maybe we celebrate diversity well. It could be that we make movies with good uh, follow-up sequels. It could be our military tradition. So, what is our central fundamental? I'm going to show you a clip that got me thinking of fundamental transformation. We are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. So that's 08. We're going to fundamentally transform the United States. So what are our fundamentals? So I showed you a couple options to think about. But if you were to put one word on it, what would it be? Constitution, rights, freedom, liberty. Take out your money and your group. See if you got a coin in there. So go ahead, do it in your table group. Somebody's got to have a coin. You notice how there's a coin shortage? You should ask yourself why that is. But what is one word? Somebody did say it. What's one word, our central fundamental? Somebody said it over here. That was added in the 50s. No, not the Constitution. Freedom. Who said freedom? Okay, that's close. And then it's liberty. Who got liberty? There you go. Uh, so, here's a gold coin. What word is printed on every coin? Liberty. By law. That is our central fundamental of this country. Lady Liberty on a gold coin. You notice her hair and gown are flowing. She's not static and sitting. She's active, dynamic, and moving, engaging in commerce. How do you measure your freedom? It's your economic freedom. Can you go and engage on what you want. A slave back in the day could work and do something, but he would not get paid. His master would get paid. He's not free. Are you free to go purchase? Are you tracked? Are you traced? What is your freedom? You notice how we're removing the freedom of a coin and going to the tracked and the traced of the electronic. What is being removed? Freedom. Liberty. Number three, the most basic fundamental of the USA is liberty. So now we're going to look at the foundation of your fundamentals. So we're going to look at two guys that were pretty instrumental in our country with liberty and freedom, especially in the middle 1800s, Civil War. We got Abe Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. And we're going to look at some of their speeches of what they're talking about. Now, Frederick Douglass is a, we all know Lincoln, but Douglass to me is a fascinating guy. He was a slave. And then he went north still as a slave. And then he came back to the South, still as a slave, getting sold, moved around. And then he finally escapes and gains his freedom. As a young man, as a boy, Frederick Douglass looked out and realized words have power. He saw it, but he's illiterate. He's a slave. They're not even going to teach him. And he, he works everything. He went down to the shipyards and graffiti stuff just etched in wood just to feel and see letters because he knew way back as a boy, letters leads to words and mastery of words is power and that's how we transform this nation and remove slavery. He was motivated to read and speak. But we're going to start uh, with how are these guys together? There's a Lincoln statue up in Portland. When did that come down? Well, 2020, right? All these riots and stuff. There's Douglas in a place in New York where he gave this famous speech. His statue uh, was torn down. Number four, statues of both Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass have been destroyed. So I like to ask a big three-letter question all the time. If you ask this a lot, you end up in interesting places. Why? Why would the statues of Lincoln and Douglas be destroyed? Why is that? What do they both stand on? Liberty, the most basic fundamental of America. So let's go to Lincoln uh, in the Battle of Gettysburg. So this is a key battle in the Civil War. We'll just read his Gettysburg Address. That might be a little hard to read here, but it fits on one deal. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation. America was new. Conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. 
Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived in liberty and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who gave their lives that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here thus far so notably advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. The war is not done yet that from those honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we were highly, we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Pretty brief speech for a president uh, in, a, in a key time, but let's look at a few things. There was a new nation. What is that new nation? That's us, America. That's what he's talking about that was conceived in what key fundamental? Liberty. Dedicated the proposition that all men are created equal. Of course, how do you have all men are created equal and slavery at the same time? And that's a complex question, but they needed to be able to defend the borders from Europe. If you don't have slavery, you don't have the South. So the Union comes first. Uh, and they're trying to figure out how to deal with slavery, and it has a pinnacle there in the Civil War. So the question is, when was the birth of the nation? And he gives this nice line here, four score and seven, so we're going to do math. Four score and seven, a score is 20, that's 87. He wrote this in 1863, so you have 1863 minus 87, and we have the birth of our nation, and you can see the math there. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Is that not right? Oh, okay. You knew that. So it must be the 1619 project, right? If you, if you do the math, it's 1619. Is that right? Okay. It's got to be the Constitution. The Constitution is the bedrock of our nation. Is that correct? Well, wait. You're saying it's not the Constitution. Ah, it's the Declaration of Independence. So that was 11 years, so the math doesn't work. You go to the proper math and you see it's 1776. The foundational document is not the Constitution, it's a declaration. Understanding that is pretty important. This declaration, and you'll notice you have one of those printed out on your table that we're going to do a little thing on in a minute. Number five, America was born with and founded upon the Declaration of Independence. So now we're going to move to Douglas. Remember, he was a slave. And he self-educated himself and finally escaped from slavery. And he was a key figure. This speech, you can see, is 1852. Remember the Civil War, 61 to 65. So this is leading up to the war. He and Lincoln are the two heavyweights that destroyed slavery in this nation. And this guy is ama pretty amazing with his words. I'm just going to pick a couple highlights of his speech to go through. And he's addressing quite an audience here. Uh, this is on July 5th. It's a speech for the 4th of July. Mr. President, friends and fellow citizens, who could address this audience without a quailing sensation has stronger nerves than I have. I do not remember ever to have appeared as a speaker before any assembly more shrinkingly nor with greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. A feeling has crept over me quite unfavorable to the exercise of my limited powers of speech. The task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. I know that apologies of this sort are generally considered flat and unmeaning. I trust, however, that mine will not be so considered. Should I seem at ease, my appearance would be a, much represent, a misrepresentation of me. The little experience I have had in addressing public meetings in county schoolhouses avails me nothing on this present occasion. The papers and placards say that I'm to deliver a 4th of July speech. So that's what he's doing. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask, why am I a black slave? 
called upon to speak here today. What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and natural justice embodied in that what document? Declaration of Independence extended to us. So he's calling out, he's an agitator, he's very logical, and he bases things on Scripture. He's calling out, look at the hypocrisy here. You're talking about equality and you don't see it. What to the American slave is your, not our, but your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. One of the things I read about Frederick Douglass is as he was talking to people, he never met a slave who could tell of his birthday. Think of that for a minute. Oh, it's your birthday, Jimmy. You don't have to stack wood today. Whatever it is, you know, he'd never met a slave who could tell one thing about his birthday. There is nothing special in your life whatsoever. To him, to the slave, your celebration of the fourth and independence is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license. Your national greatness swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There's not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. He's calling people out, isn't he? That's, that's a pretty uncomfortable speech. Pride and patriotism, not less than gratitude, prompt you to celebrate and hold on to it in perpetual remembrance. I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. There's a ring bolt holding the chain. And so, indeed, I regard it. The principles contained in the Declaration, in that instrument, are saving principles. Here's what he's saying. He's calling out the white people. Stand by the principles in the Declaration. Be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and at whatever cost. He understands that we're being inconsistent. It's the Declaration that is the key point, and are we going to obliterate that? It's the ring bolt to the chain of our destiny. Number six, the declaration is the ring bolt to the chain of our nation's destiny. Fellow citizens, I'm not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of this Declaration of Independence were brave men. They were great men too, great enough to give them fame to a great age. It does not often happen to a nation to raise one, at one time such a number of truly great men. The point from which I'm compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable, because he's going from slavery. And yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes, and for the good they did and the principles they contend for, I will unite with you in honor of their memory. But this 4th of July is yours and not mine. My business, if I have any here today, is with the present. The accepted time, you notice he goes to God all the time, the accepted time with God and his cause is now. Number seven, God is most concerned with what we choose to do now, today. doesn't matter what was done in the past. Yes, there was this great independence uh, you know, in, several decades ago, but what are you doing now and are you still standing on those principles? The hypocrisy of this nation must be exposed and its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. The slave trade. Did you know in our declaration, it talks about, because remember there's a the independence, 1776, 11 years later you have the Constitution. In the Constitution, because they're having to get everybody together, you have to defend the borders, they actually agreed and said, okay, we will not pass a law for 20 years banning slavery. That's right in the, declar in, in the Constitution. 20 years and one day, the first day it was legal, Thomas Jefferson abolished the slave trade. That's, what, that's 45 years before he's speaking here. So what he's saying now is that slave trade has long since, 45 years ago, been denounced by this government as piracy. It has been denounced with burning words from the highest places, from the very president of this nation as an inexorable, what does that mean? Have great loathing for this traffic of slaves. To arrest it 
to put an end to it, this nation keeps a naval fleet off of Africa, calling it piracy. So our nation said that slave trade is unethical, it's greatly loathed, and we will fund a fleet to prevent the slave trade from Africa. But, look, it's a notable fact that with so much great loathing is poured out by Americans upon those engaged in the foreign slave trade, foreign, the men engaged in the slave trade between the states in our country pass without condemnation, and it's viewed as honorable. He's pointing out the hypocrisy that you'll fight it over there, but you allow it here. Fellow citizens, there is no matter in respect to which the people of the North have allowed themselves to be so ruinously imposed upon as the pro-slavery character of the Constitution. What does this mean? When he went back up North, and he's now, he escaped and he's free, he of course comes across abolitionists. This would be kind of like the white liberals up in New York, and they are denouncing slavery. But they said some things. They said the Constitution is a pro-slavery document. Here you have a slave who's learned to read and he finally gets a hold of the Constitution and he realizes that was a lie that they were saying. The Constitution is not a pro-slavery document. So he's even calling those guys out. Now take the Constitution according to its plain reading and I defy the presentation of a single pro-slavery clause in it. On the other hand, it will be found to contain principles and purposes entirely hostile to the existence of slavery. Why do you think we don't study guys like this in school? You profess to believe, and now he quotes scripture, that of one blood God made all the nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has commanded all men everywhere to love one another. Yet you notoriously hate and glory in your hatred all men whose skin is not colored like yours. You declare before the world and are understood by the world to declare that you hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So he's calling us out. He says, would you have me, a former slave, argue that a man is entitled to liberty? You have already declared it in your, con in your declaration. Allow me to say in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have in this day presented to the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. The arm of the Lord is not shortened. The doom of slavery is certain. I therefore leave off where I began with hope while drawing encouragement from the key document, Declaration of Independence, and the great principles it contains. So number eight, Douglas had hope in America due to the principles contained in the Declaration. Frederick Douglass, black guy, Slave, rose out of it, the most photographed man in the 19th century. And he understood the power of words and communication, and he always made sure when he was photographed that he was dignified and professional and articulate. And you notice what is beside him. Scripture, the Bible. He was offensive. He was offensive to the abolitionists pointing out you're misconstruing the document. He is offensive to the white Christians. You are hypocrites. You're claiming liberty. You're quoting scripture. You say you're based on God, and you're not. He's calling them out. So he's a very offensive guy. Truth is offensive. Lincoln and Douglas understood something about liberty. Where does it come from? What document? in the Bible, and legally in this country, where does it come from? What document? The Declaration of Independence. What is the foundation for your fundamental? So the fundamental is liberty, but it can't just exist out of thin air. Lincoln called the Declaration apples of gold in settings of silver. So the Declaration and Independence is the apple of gold, and the Constitution is the silver around it to protect it. So it's the Declaration of Independence. These two men, Lincoln and Douglas, have had their statues torn down. Why? We've got to think why. What did they stand on? Are the people tearing down statues just kind of kid ruining stuff in general? Or do they actually have a philosophy? Of course they have a philosophy of what they're doing. They are destroying our connection to the Declaration. 
That's why their statues are torn down. They're not random acts of violence. So now we're going to do a little word search. So you've got your declaration there. You can take a minute to look at this. Um, and it fits on one page. I'm going to show you how we're going to reduce this to make it easy, though. I've just squared up the first two paragraphs. So in any document, your first paragraphs are your opening salvos, right? So don't go beyond the first two. We're going to erase that middle part. And we're not going to talk about how this is all formed together. We're just doing an exercise here. Then you see the last paragraph, the summary. That's where the principles are. We're not looking at all the details. We're looking at the principles. So we're going to take the middle part out, take the first two paragraphs and the last one, put them together. So now I just gave you the whole thing. But look through there, and here's your assignment. How many times is God referenced in our Declaration of Independence? Do this as, as your table. Uh, you hopefully you can create some conflict. You've got about a minute or two. See what you can find. How many times is God mentioned or referenced in the Declaration? Now, as you're working on this, I was going to ask Bill to comment, but I saw him still choking on his rib bone that was down his throat. But, uh, so we'll do this together, uh, and so you can take these home with you. So who... How, how many times? What are they, what's the answer? Three times. I heard two times. Three. Who said two? That's a little wimpy. Two. Kid, what did you say? Okay. Now, so the kids are always honest. And look at the question. How many times has God mentioned one, but how many times has God referenced that's where we're going to get a little bit tricky. What does a reference mean? Four. Okay, and we had a five. So Skeet, who's right? Ah, he didn't bring his glasses. So uh, Skeet is our expert and he's right. That's the judge is there is four. So four times, let's look at where they are. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. Who is that? That is God. The and notice He has a capital C. Here's the easy one. Laws of nature and nature's God. So who's that? Well, He called God with a capital G. So that's an easy one there. That's the second one. You Notice I'm putting these in an order. How you have God is a Creator. That's, it wasn't mentioned first, but that's the overarching thing. He is the Creator. Because He is the Creator, He is the giver of law to, the, to nature. And they're putting themselves under the judgment of the supreme judge of the world for the morally correct actions that they have done. So they're submitting their actions to the judge of the world. That's God with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, with a capital P. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, fortunes, and sacred What is providence? God does not wind up things and let it go. God is involved. He providentially cares for His creation. That's the executor. So let's think about this for a minute. There's one. God is the Creator. That is the primary role of God. He is Creator. As Creator, He is the giver of law to nature. As Creator, He is the judge to whom we are accountable. As Creator, He is divine providence and the executor of the estate. He's involved. He's not distant. Number nine, the Declaration states that liberty comes from God. It states it right there. That's a legal document. That's the founding of our country. So what is our fundamental? Liberty. What is its foundation? God. And it says it right in the document. So now we're in position to start seeing what is the foundation for our fundamentals. God is the Creator. He self-exists. As such, He is the legislator. He is the giver of law. Laws of nature. He is also the judicial. He is the supreme judge of the world. He is also the executive. He is divine providence. You notice that comes right from Scripture, the model of our government? God is our judge. He is our lawgiver. He is our king. Why is our government set up the way it is? Oh, wow. The Declaration. God. It's not that complicated. Number 10. God is the creator. As such, he is lawgiver, judge, and king. 
So now we've got the, the table set to go to our last little thing, which is progress. And especially if you think of progressive as far as the government. What does progress mean? Movement. So you might start on point A if you progress. Now who defines progress is the question. But you're going to stay put or you're going to move? You're going to move to go to B. Number 11. Progress requires the action of movement or rest. Movement. It requires movement. So you both get it, but the kid might beat you to it. So it requires movement. Compare that to be still and know that I am God. Stand firm on your foundation. You notice you don't stand firm on this foundation and progress away from it. So here, I just found this, and the reason I, I looked this one up is uh, my, my son's girlfriend uh, was on the, the picture of the paper in Albany, and right above it was this thing when they were debating this new bill for the infrastructure thing up in the trillions of dollars. And right there I saw Nancy Pelosi talking about it being transformed. Bingo. Once you kind of understand what's going on, you see these words. Transformative. What does transformation mean? What is a fundamental transformation? Transformative means we will progress from the eyes of humanism in the world. From a foundation of liberty, God, we will progress and move away from that towards a vaguely defined progress this way, but what it means is moving away from the foundation. That's transformation. Whenever you see the word transformation or transformative, there it is, there it is, there it is. You know, it's progressive people who say this bill, trillions of dollars, must be transformative. And so a progressive usually doesn't have bad intentions. They just think government solves problems. You can't have a bigger government and individual liberty at the same time. As big government grows, individual liberty goes down. You can't move them both in the same direction. That's what transformation means, especially a fundamental transformation. We don't want to be useful idiots. You were all useful idiots when we looked at football. And you called seven-on-seven seven football. You're a useful idiot. You can be manipulated because you didn't understand your fundamentals. So the purpose of this is for us to think a little bit, what are our fundamentals of this nation? And when we understand it's liberty, where did liberty come from? It came from God. Now we're not such a useful idiot when we understand when our fundamentals are being removed. You see, a, a progressive pipe dream is a $15 minimum wage. What's the minimum wage now? You notice we got there without this big debate on the value and pros and cons of a $15 minimum wage? So the question would be, what fundamental has been destroyed to get us a $15 minimum wage? So I'm, I'm causing us to think a little bit here. What are the fundamentals? What, what's happening with inflation? In order to get the $15 minimum wage, look at the wrecking ball through the economy, specifically inflation. And we're not going to do an economic talk, but how do you define in, uh, inflation? That's breach of trust by the keepers of the currency. So you're saving up, you want to get to 50 grand to buy this cool truck, and you're at 20 grand and it inflates to 55, you get to 30, it goes to 62. You never can save enough money to catch the truck. That's a breach of trust. You are working and saving and you can't catch it. That's inflation at its simplest terms, a breach of trust of the keepers of the currency. Here's the other one, healthcare. Last two years, look at COVID. We, we notice we have not debated a single payer system, but we have moved very rapidly into it. De facto, we're essentially in a single-payer system uh, with here's a protocol, here it is, a narrow funnel. You dare not go outside of that funnel. And people get confused. Is healthcare right or not? We're not going to discuss that, but there's a lot of people that don't understand this, and they're useful idiots in this conversation. You notice now, as we have moved, what is the fundamental in healthcare? And so you would probably you'd have to think about this, but again, it's the same thing with the currency and inflation. The fundamental of healthcare is trust, just like with a currency. You can't run any currency, you can't run any economy without a trusted currency. The patient physician relationship is based on trust. That's the fundamental that's being destroyed. I've been asked dozens of times by people walking around, hey, do you trust what's going on? Interesting question that people on the street are starting to figure that out. Psalms 12, or number 12. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? 
So, this concept or phrase, fundamental transformation, is undergoing right now at a rapid pace in our country, but do we understand our fundamentals? How would you know if your fundamentals are being destroyed or transformed if you can't peg what they are? If you don't know what they are, you'll never know it. So I'm going to close with what we started with. It may seem subtle, but it's of vital importance that you understand your fundamentals. More importantly, what is the foundation upon which your fundamentals rest? You call this football. I know I kind of manipulated a little bit, but I tried to do that to make you think. That ain't football. The fundamentals of blocking and tackling are removed, and you naively let yourself be manipulated to call that football. You all said it. Nobody said seven on seven. Look at that stupid thing. That, you don't see that in a football game, do you? Right? What is the fundamental of our country? Liberty. Now you know that very clear. And it's printed on the money because that is a representation of your liberty. And it's, notice that's being removed from you. What is this all based on? There's got to be a foundation. The legal document is a declaration. Number 13. Fundamentals are important. Understanding the foundation for the fundamentals is critical. It's the declaration. But more than that, what does the declaration come from? I'll say it again. I'm giving you a hint. What does the declaration come from? God. The declaration gives us liberty and the liberty comes from who? God, you notice it's not King James, it's not the Senate, it's not the President, it's not the legislature, it's not the school board. Your liberty comes from God. 14, to fundamentally transform the USA requires the removal of God. See how simple that is? We just have to think it through. So what are the fundamentals? In football, what are they? Blocking and tackling. With our country, what is it? Liberty. Foundation. What is the foundation of liberty in this country? The Declaration of Independence. That's the legal foundation. Below that would be God. You did a word search. Take those declarations home. Read through that. Uh, that gives you a great way of handling authority. That would be a talk for a different day, how to break that down. But there's four times that God is mentioned or referenced in the Declaration. And then we understood what progressivism is, is a move from this foundation to another poorly defined one, but progress is simply moving away from this foundation, which is liberty and God. The Declaration is the ring bolt that holds our entire concept of liberty together. Uh, so hopefully that gave you something to think about. Uh, if there's any questions, that's fine. And then uh, we'll probably have to involve Skeet with those. Uh, or we'll pray and get rolling. Uh, so let's pray and get you guys out for uh, uh, get your day. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this day. Thank you that we can gather here uh, and study your word and apply it to our world. Help us to be men that are not naive, uh, that are not useful idiots. Uh, Lord, but men who realize your word is truth, it's eternal truth, uh, and it will always be assaulted and under attack. And help us to stand firmly on your word and not the ideas of man. Thank you for giving us this great nation with liberty. Uh, help us to be warriors that defend your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.